Hello again, folks. Um, this is the video for the last two sections, section 10.1 and 10.2, which are the law of sines and the law of cosines, respectively. Um, I took the liberty of drawing a triangle here just because it is, in fact, chapter 10. Um, anyhow, this also summarizes uh, what the two subjects are collectively. They're about non right triangles. Today is, let me just show you. I, as I mentioned in, in my message that I had sent you, I rearranged the schedule just to um, try to give you as much time as possible between now and the end of the week so that you can try these homework problems. Um, anyhow, uh, what I'm going to do uh, here again is today the 15th of December. I've, I'm going to cover these two sections and then on Thursday I'm going to uh, mail you a copy of the final and go over the solutions via video. And then that will be it. Um, you're not responsible for anything else. You don't have to be um, submitting anything. Just if you would uh, try the extra credit that I uh, had sent you in announcements, okay? okay? That's for the math department so that they can compile data. That's an easy grade. Um, you just gotta scan it though, or maybe take a picture. Anyhow, let me put this away. The packet is three pages. I did produce a second packet. I'll show you this first. This is, these are items that you already have, but I made them one PDF file. So if you want a, a summary of the entire semester's worth of material, I'm going to make this available for you. It's not immediately important, but it has um, it's information taken from the textbook, the graphs of the uh, algebraic and non-algebraic functions, right, which are kind of cool. And it has the domains and ranges. And then the identities and formulas that you already have as well. Okay, It's just not chopped up. It's a nice and clean piece of paper. And it includes the last... Um, two sections on it. The only thing that's missing from this, and I'm not sure why the textbook didn't include it, are some area formulas that I'm going to give you today. Anyhow, you're welcome to print that. This, like I said, it's a sort of a summary of the entire semester. What is relevant right now are these pages. I made this, this diagram to help you distinguish between what is applicable for laws of signs versus those that are laws of cosines. Unfortunately, the sunlight is bleeding through the paper a little bit, but I tried to highlight the edges of the uh, triangle and uh, indicate some angles here and here. So if you see something like an angle and you're reading sort of uh, counterclockwise, um, an angle, a side, and then a second angle, that is a side that is in between two angles. So if you you recognize that that's the, the measurements that you have, then you would know that you would use laws of signs specifically, or an angle, an angle, and a side, or in theory, a side, pardon me, an angle, a side, and a side. Um, laws of cosines are for these two scenarios. Right? Uh, when you have just have uh, side dimensions, no angles at all, or when you have an angle as you normally would between two sides. Okay. The um, formulas are summarized here on this piece of paper. I would definitely print this and some information that is useful, right? especially if you're looking for an angle. Okay. And then there's um, a page for uh, some area formulas that I thought were useful. If you have a triangle that is basically SAS, side, angle, side, that is an angle in between two sides. This would be a, a, a good option for area formula, right? If you have a situation where you have just three sides, you could use famously Heron's formula, which is uh, from geometry, right? You do have to calculate the semi-perimeter first, right? Or half perimeter, if you like. And so it's always kind of two, two chores, right? Yeah, do print that. Right? And we'll go through this now. stubborn because it's cold, but if I have to, well, I'll put the 
alcohol. Decide to keep it out of trouble. My calculator. Oh, it's gonna break. <laughs> Don't do that. Be so Audi. Yeah, that's exactly what I didn't want to have happen. <laughs> Up you go. Okay. Right, now I need to put my eyeballs on. Mm -hmm. Take a sip of water here. Now, um, what we have discussed to this point uh, in terms of triangle trigonometry, I should put the light on. Uh, triangle trig, if you will, are some formulas essentially for right triangles, which means something that would have that box in the corner. And these included things like. Firstly, the Pythagorean theorem, um, just perhaps with different labels, but famously a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And then trig ratios, uh, such as sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent is opposite over adjacent. All, right. all, all goes to you. All right. um, what we'll be doing now is considering formulas essentially for um, what they call oblique triangles. Right. It essentially means non-right. Anything that isn't a right triangle is considered oblique. It means slanted somehow. Right. As opposed to having a nice straight perpendicular edge here and here. Okay. The material that is from basically uh, section 10.1 are the laws of signs. And the material that is from section 10.2 are the laws of cosines. Okay. Which are new formulas. Um, as I mentioned, the actual formulas. Oh, I haven't. on this one. The actual formulas for both are on this piece of paper. Right. Above here are all delineated the laws of cosine, part of the laws of sines, which are basically something you would use in pairs. You know, like a proportion equation. <laughs> and the laws of cosines are a derivative of, uh, as you can see, familiar Pythagorean theorem. Right. They're adapted from that. The material that you see down here is just the laws of cosines rearranged to help you solve for an angle. You would have to use an inverse function to get the alpha angle, the beta angle, or the gamma angle. But it's you know, this is basically things that you would punch into your calculator. Okay. What is a little bit more tricky and takes a little getting used to used to is deciding, well, which situation do I have? Which is why I made this diagram. All right. Try to look at things either this way, this way, or this way, or that way, or that way. All right. And that will help you basically uh, decide what formula you're going to go with. Okay. All right. Um, the laws of cosines, pardon me, the laws of sines, are for angle, side, angle, that's what you were given, right, in, in initials, an angle, a side in between, and then a second angle, um, or angle, angle, side, and then the last one is kind of just, uh, I don't know how else to say this, it's just sort of written politely, all right, 
Uh, but I, I have a juvenile sense of humor, but you know, it's written side, side, angle, but that isn't necessarily the order in which you will read it, all right? Um, it's just, textbooks uh, try to have some kind of degree of uh, composure and etiquette, you know, not juvenile sense of humor like me, perhaps. Um, anyhow. If it helps you remember, you know, you, you could see which one that is. <laughs> Just put the letters in reverse order. Um, ten two, again, laws of cosines. These are for situations when you have um, an angle between two sides, right? Or if you have strictly three sides, give them two. In addition, um, there are two area formulas. The area formulas, though one of them is brought up in section 10.1, might just as well have been appropriate to include in section 10.2, because um, I'll refer to it now. Right. The area formulas are based upon these situations. Right. Either SAS, Right. You have an angle known between two sides that are known, or you have three sides that are known. This is famously Heron's formula. This does not have a name. Right. Anyhow, those really do pertain to this section, but you could they're, they're brought up in section 10.1, at least the first of these, right? the SAS type. Right. Right. Anyhow, so we're going to have included in this uh, also area formulas. Okay. Now, um, the initials uh, suggest um, both the type and the arrangement. Let me erase one thing. Okay. Initials, as you read them, Type and the order of arrangement. This is kind of a redundant phrase, but I think it's better. Right. So if you see again SSA, it means that the angle is not in between these things. All right. If you see an S in between two A's, that means that it is literally there is a side in between two angles. Right. The only reason I would labor over this is just that you want to choose the, the, the easiest course of action when you're trying to do a calculation. Should I go with these formulas or should I go with those formulas? Based upon these arrangements, you'll make that decision. Okay. Let's see. this and I'm probably gonna have to hit this with some alcohol here because it's a little stubborn talk about uh, um, how the, these were derived. Uh, they're actually fairly intuitive. Mm -hmm. I know, I know. Okay. 
Um, if you can imagine for a moment, I'm gonna have to write in blue because I suspect that the black is gonna be trouble. Um, maybe if I choose the right one, <laughs> we'll test the theory here. Uh, imagine that you had um, a triangle that was, again, not a right triangle. This is oblique, right? Non-right triangle. And you choose to label the uh, vertices and the angles um, using, instead of theta, a different um, Greek character. So let's just say that we call this angle here alpha, right? And then I'm just gonna go kind of clockwise, counterclockwise here. Uh, we'll call this angle uh, beta, right? And then the last one here, gamma. Right? Hopefully my uh, script is not too bad. The labeling, which you may have to do yourself if they just give you descriptions rather than pictures, right? should always be like this. Right? The sides, always opposite of the related angle. So um, if alpha is the Greek letter for A, right? and we're using it, a Greek letter to represent an angle, the side would be across from it here, right? So we'll call this A and regular lowercase a. It's kind of fancy. B, lowercase b, right? Gamma, um, I think the textbook chose gamma not to use capital C because capital C and lowercase c look just too much alike. So um, they just use lowercase c and gamma for that would have been, gamma I want to say would be g if you translated it, but uh, these two are associated, right? So b and b essentially an a and a, but use lowercase letters English letters for side lengths. And Greek letters is technically also lowercase for angles. It's a little sloppy, geez. Hey. Okay. Okay. And they're always opposite of each other, right? Again, you may have to draw this picture a couple of times yourself. All right. um, what ends up happening, and I'll just clean this up now because I like to sort fresh if I can. You need to get in the habit of um, basically deciding what is given and what isn't given, but maybe before I do that, let me complete this thought. Here is again the same triangle, but written a little bit nicer. Alpha, beta, gamma. And to get some distinction here, uh, I'll put these in a different color. A, B, and C respectively. The way that the laws of sines are derived, right, taking into consideration this is not a right triangle, is we're still gonna try to use trig ratios, but we're gonna have to manipulate the situation. So what is done is the triangle that you were given is chopped up so that there is in fact, right, a right triangle in it, you know, it itself is not a right triangle, but you can make two smaller right triangles, right? And we'll just call this uh, H as in height, right? Which will be important later if you're doing areas. Anyhow, if you wanted to calculate this dimension, right, um, you would use sine, right? Start with what sine stands for, sine of theta, is famously opposite over hypotenuse. Right. And we will just change the labels. Just check them here. Really? Okay. That's 
it's an advertisement, right? Normally, like if this was superimposed upon a coordinate plane, we'd probably label something vertical as Y, but we're gonna go with the uh, Sokotoa to start with, so just opposite over hypotenuse, and then incorporate these, um, these labels here, right? So we're gonna call opposite of alpha, in this case, is this, uh, this height dimension, right? And hypotenuse in this case would be this would be referred to as B. Right? Simultaneously, if you were looking at the same dimension here, but from this perspective, from B rather than alpha, right? You would still use sine, right? Sine of theta. But you change the labels, perhaps slightly. You'd say, well, opposite of this angle B is still H, right? And the hypotenuse over here would be A. Right. See, it's some further distinction, right? You know that we're not going to use theta because theta is very general. What I should really do is, if I'm talking about this specific trig ratio, this H and this B, I should call this a different Greek letter. So instead of theta, which is more or less general, I'll be slightly more specific. I'll say sine of alpha, right? Over here, sine of beta instead. Right? That means that I essentially have this. The sine of alpha is equal to H over B. And the sine of beta is equal to H over A. Now, if we want to uh, kind of absolve ourselves of the responsibility of looking for H, what we can do is basically solve this equation for H and then simultaneously solve this equation for H and then set the equations equal to each other. Right. So what we'll do in this case is if you want to solve the H here, that is to get H alone, right? multiply by B instead of divide. And if you did it here, you're obligated to do it here. These would cancel. All right. If you were going to solve for H in this case, the exact same measurements, whatever it may be, you would move the A specifically. And I'm going to just tuck an A in here. A sorry. And these A's would cancel. If I have two equations that equal the exact same thing as these now do because of the rearrangement, and what you can do is set one equation equal to the other, which means that if H is equal to H, however silly that may sound, right? instead of calling it that, you can call it this. Right? And from the perspective of alpha, beta times the sine of alpha, is equal to, from the perspective of beta, alpha times sine of B. This is kind of dying on me. Just for the sake of space here, move this. Yeah. And now um, we get the satisfaction of sort of rearranging this a little bit better. I can now kind of slightly undo what I just did, but uh, put it in a place, this letter B, close to what it most is uh, similar to, so angle B. Right? And at the same time, move this A over here where the alpha is. Right? It seems to be undoing it, but the only purpose of arranging A here and B here initially was just to arrive at two things that are equal to each other, the H's, right? We're manipulating. So if you divide by B here, then it would be down there. And if you divide by A here, the cancellation, then you would have an A here. And that's the law of sine. That the sine of angle alpha over the length alpha, uh, A, length A, 
is equal to the sine of beta over length b. And there are basically three incarnations of this. The third one would be using gamma and using c instead. You, you, you realistically, when you're taking advantage of this relationship, you're using two ratios set equal to each other, all right, which is famously what? A proportion equation. How does one solve a proportion equation? When you have a ratio, which is a glorified fraction, something that has this line here, right? Set equal to a second ratio, collectively you have what we refer to as a proportion equation. And a proportion equation is solved by the process of cross-multiplication. So, um, if you know basically three out of four parts, if you can think of this as some number that's here, some number that's here, here, and here potentially, as long as you have the majority of information, but that is with all algebraic equations, you could figure out what the fourth one is, right? And how you do that, you cross multiply this way and this way. You end up with a nice equation, a proportion equation. This one's kind of dying too. Put that there. All right, now let's do an example. Well, you know what, let me uh, show you the other uh, derivation first, and then I'll just do examples all the way out. This is the law of sines, essentially. One ratio set equal to another ratio, incorporating the function, the trig function, sine exclusively. say that you had another oblique triangle and it's arranged like this kind of skinny make it a little bit more exaggerated obviously slanted something like that and in theory not that it has to be but uh, just to make it a little bit more linear, think of this as being from the origin you know, on a coordinate axis like so. So x, y. Okay. If I label these vertices and the angles, um, point A, point B, I'll, you know, just for the sake of consistency, I'll use this counterclockwise. A, B, C. Um, and I'll put an angle theta in here. We could manipulate this drawing as well so that we could take advantage of uh, the formulas from right triangle trigonometry. Right? It's itself, again, non-right. So an oblique triangle. But we need to work with the tools we have. We're going to adapt this drawing. Right. Let us say that 
we drew a second triangle right adjacent to it, right here like this, right. and kind of in tandem creating a right triangle out of something that was oblique. Then we could take advantage of some formulas that we already are familiar with. We would label this perhaps Y, right? if it's on a coordinate plane, right? And from point A to out here, we would refer to this as X. The labeling for this dimension down here on the horizontal X is only going to be useful really because we want to sort of decide how we're going to chop up the segment from B to this corner and perhaps from A to B. It's really more from here to here that is important. If I were to consider the length of the segment from here to here, just using the letters that I have drawn here, the whole distance is x. Let's say that if I call this um, D, something like that, then the distance from here to here would be, this smaller distance, would be X minus D. Okay, and there's just one, um, maybe one more thing. I should fill in here. An A would be here because it is across from this point, and a B would be here because it is across from this point. So if you can imagine this is an angle, I didn't label it alpha and beta, but if you think of that vertex B and that point B as being where an angle would be, the B, 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 right, then the dimension that would be what we think of normally as the hypotenuse would be across from it, right? Okay. The hard part of this is really just making sure all of these labels are put into position and then we could uh, plug them into Pythagorean theorem, right? There's one other thing I want to do here. For C, if C is part of this larger triangle that incorporates the blue dashed line as well, so that it is a truly right triangle, then the coordinates that would normally be x comma y here, right? would be derived from, in respect of this angle, cosine of theta and the sine of theta. Right? But one other dimension too, because who knows if this is a right triangle, pardon me, if this is part of a unit circle or not. If cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse and the sine of theta is the opposite of the hypotenuse. Let's just incorporate the labels that are in this drawing right, into that. Adjacent right, uh, to this theta here would be x. Right? And hypotenuse in respect of this angle theta would be ironically, perhaps, um, B, right? So if cosine of theta is really equal to X over B, and we're trying to solve more or less for X, what that means is that you would have to move the B value. And that means that there's a B in front of this cosine. Okay. Similarly, if we were to take advantage of the trig ratio of the sine, all right? Opposite of this would be y, right? And the hypotenuse would be the same strange sort of labeling b dimension here, b. So if sine of theta is essentially y over b, 
and we're trying to solve for y specifically for the coordinates of this point because it's going to be useful we would again have to move b here to that side so there would be again a b in front of the sine dimension and those would be the coordinates instead of using x's and y's the good news is we're basically done all right The textbook, unfortunately, did one thing different than what I did. So I'm going to conform myself, and I hope you will forgive me. All right. I don't like using the letter that I have to here, but just so it emulates the formulas that you see on this paper here, because this is what I'm going through the process of, I can't use the letter D. All right. So I'm just going to use a lowercase c instead of the d. I hate doing that, but I kind of have to just to, for the sake of conformity. All right? This is capital C, and this is lowercase. All right? They really should have labeled this gamma in the textbook, but they so do. Anyhow, let's use Pythagorean theorem now. The Pythagorean theorem is famously what? Right. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That's how it's written in general. Right. What I'm going to do now is take the parts that we I've been trying to contrive here and insert them in the appropriate places. Unfortunately, it's a little confusing for the reason that the, the generalization is using different labels than what I'm using. So I'm going to be extra careful. In place of A, right, I'm going to go with Y, right? that specific dimension, the vertical dimension. And if I choose that, then that means that this B would ordinarily be the X dimension. I'm going to have to go a little bit further with that in a moment. right? The C value here is B in this case. All right? And again, I borrow this from the textbook. All right. So that's B squared. We're just changing the labels. Pythagorean right? theorem with different labels. All right. I'm going to go a little bit further now by substituting at least this X value. And to do that, um, I need a little bit of space, so I'm going to move this and that. In place of X here, Jumping the gun a little bit. I'm gonna make one change. B squared. I'm gonna go directly to the horizontal here. talking but I have to. Yeah. All right. Let's look at this triangle specifically. All right. The x dimension that would be here, which is the bottom, which is usually b, hate that, right. is x minus c. And so it would be instead of b squared, you would call it x minus c squared, right? But again, you have to take it one step further. 
x, all right, dimension is in reference to this point up here, that particular x. And x can be written as b times cosine. So to go one step further, this x that is here is b times cosine of theta minus c, the whole thing squared. Basically, this version of the Pythagorean theorem is being discussed in reference to this uh, cross-hashed black triangle here, right? Its dimensions here and its dimensions here, okay? So what you end up with is this then. Y squared plus, I'm going to write it a little bit neater, B cosine of theta minus C squared is equal to B squared, that is this dimension in this way. Oh, sorry. Instead of A, mm, yeah. If it's in reference to this particular cro uh, cross hash triangles I mentioned, then I'm not going to call this B then. I'm going to use that particular A because that is the hypotenuse. Basically, zero in on this. X minus C, Y, and A. That is the hypotenuse instead. Right? I hate the labeling, unfortunately. This is what I have to work with. All right? And I didn't really create this. I'm borrowing it. All right? And then X minus C is that X dimension here, otherwise known as the bottom, if you will. A is an altitude, we're calling that still Y. That's the only thing that is consistent between this smaller triangle and the red triangle. So you have Y squared plus this, and this is instead labeled A squared. Please forgive labeling. The weird labeling. Okay, now what you end up with is sort of a binomial-esque thing, a uh, factor term, really. And this conforms to the perfect square trinomial model of factoring. If you square this two-term wide factor, if you will, then it follows the model that is perfect square trinomial, which means that you end up with y squared, that was here, plus b squared cosine of square of theta, um, minus, because it's a negative incarnation of this, twice the outside. So it's going to be 2bc cosine of theta. And then plus c squared. And then on the opposite side, it's still a. I need the space. So what is next? Y squared plus B squared cosine squared of theta minus 2BC cosine of theta plus C squared equals A squared. The A is in this particular hypotenuse. Bad labeling. Somewhat on my part, also on the textbook part. Okay. There's one other thing we could do with this A. Remember that point C out here was uh, B cosine of theta for the X and B sine of theta for the Y. All right. That means in place of Y, in theory, could do this as well. B sine of theta. And it happens to be squared as well. 
which means that if you apply the squaring to both of these factors, and you should, it affects both the, the coefficient technically of b here and also the trig function, which is written in the middle. And what you would see is basically this. b squared sine squared of theta, then this, plus b squared cosine squared of theta minus 2bc cosine of theta plus c squared equals a squared. In, buried in this is something that can be factored as b squared and then um, the Pythagorean identity. Pythagorean identity is really just sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta. And what do they equal? One. Okay. So it's b squared times one. That means that this entire chunk is now really just b squared minus 2bc cosine of theta plus sine squared, uh, c squared equals a squared. If you rearrange this a little bit nicer and neater, and you maybe put the A on the left side as opposed to on the right side, the way it worked out here. What you will see is basically this first of the three incarnations of the laws of cosine. It's a derivative of the Pythagorean theorem. That's why you see A squared, B squared, and C squared. The truth of the matter is it's just the labels that have changed. So if you take the time to go through the derivation yourself, and you probably do it less sloppy than me, all right, just remind yourself of that. It's the labels that have changed, all right? It's unfortunate, but this is the way it works. Anyhow, when you're using this, make sure that you have, if you're looking for A specifically, side A, you need the dimensions that are side B, side C, and angle A, right? That is the angle in between these two things. If you're looking for B, you would need A and C and beta. That is the angle in between these two things, right, and so forth, all right? These are the same formulas just rearranged if you're trying to look for the angle specifically, okay? Let's do some examples. specific, it does imply something. When you solve, it means find all angles and all sides, which is basically six things, because you'll have three sides and three angles. What I do for my own sake is I make a little table every time, A, B, C, and alpha, beta, gamma for the angles, right? And based upon either description that you're given or a drawing, all right, fill in those voids as best you can. That will help you decide whether you're gonna ultimately use sine uh, formulas or cosine formulas, all right? So for example, here's a triangle that looks like this. This is a terrible marker. Alpha, they've decided to use gamma here now instead, okay, and his beta, all right? 
and there's an angle of 50 degrees in here and 30 in here and these dimensions 10 and nothing here and nothing here all right. convince yourself all right the sides are opposite the angles that are related to them. So what is this dimension of 10? Being that it is opposite of alpha, this would have to be A. And therefore I would go, all right, well, I know that A is 10 then. And I know that angle alpha is 50 degrees. Um, gamma is also given, uh, but we're gonna change, add some labels here. If the sides are always opposite of their related angles, that means that opposite of 30 over here would be C, which is not known yet. I'll just leave it as C then. All right. And similarly, neither the angle nor the, the side dimension of B is known. That is also unknown. So I'll just leave it as B. Okay. This is how much information is actually available to us, which means that we need to figure out that side dimension, that side dimension, and that angle. And then I would consider where these things are arranged. I have an angle, a second angle, and then a side dimension that is given to me. So to choose uh, the uh, initial label, uh, labeling. This would be angle, angle, side. It is that type. And therefore it is a law of signs that I need. Basically a, a proportion equation. Just to reinforce this, you have a situation like this, an angle given to you, an angle given to you in a side dimension, that means the side is not between the angles, then you have a law of sine to use. Alright. Um, you don't necessarily need to jump the gun and go straight for the law of signs. You could also fall back on older uh, principles that you're familiar with. Right. I'll put a little thought cloud here. This is terrible. That one's not so great either. That one's the best one. Okay, these ones will go away. <laughs> Remember, Triangle sum theorem says that angle one plus angle two plus angle three adds up to how many degrees? 180. So if you have two angles, you don't need to involve, you know, a sine, cosine, or tangent in order to calculate that. All right? You could figure it out independently. So let's do that first. Let's figure out what beta is. All right? um, if a triangle is 180 degrees total, okay. then the other two angles are 50 and 30, all right? 50 plus 30 is 80, which means that the missing angle here would have to be the difference, which is 100 degrees. So therefore, B beta is 100 degrees, all right? Now I'm going to try to use a law of sine to calculate the missing dimensions that are the side lengths. Okay. And I could really use uh, any two that I like. Alpha and beta, um, beta and gamma, alpha and gamma if I like. So I'll start with um, the thing that is uh, pretty secure here. I have an alpha and I have an A. So I'll just start with that. I'm going to set it equal to, um, we'll go with beta and B, I suppose. Sine theta over B. 
fill in the information or rearrange it first. We don't need the angle anymore because we already calculated it. So what we'll do is we'll solve for B, right? And unfortunately, we'll do a little bit of rearranging first because it's a denominator. So I'm going to multiply by B here to cancel and then plop it on this side. Um, or, you know, I guess I got no choice. And I'll move A as well. If A is being divided here, then I'll multiply to cancel it and then put it there. That means that I have um, beta times the sine of alpha is equal to A, pardon me, B times the sine of alpha is equal to A times the sine of beta. Now I just have to divide that out the sine of alpha here. Okay, so the B value will be whatever this is. That's B, because this cancels. Insert um, whatever numbers that you have. We have A is 10. We have the degree of beta is 100 degrees. And we have alpha is 50. And this you can plug into your calculator. Just make sure it's set into uh, degree mode. I'm gonna check myself, it looks like it is. Degree mode. And just be careful with the syntax. 10 times the sine of 100 divided by the sine of 50. So you'll see something like that. I'm just gonna scroll over a little bit, there you go. And to, and let's say we round it to the tenth, tenths place. So about 12.9 it looks like. B is 12.9. Now we just need to do the same thing again uh, for the, um, the C length. So, um, I would still start out with the thing that was not um, measured by me, the thing that was uh, for sure, supposedly 10 and 50 degrees here, which is alpha over A, and now we'll just incorporate um, gamma here, so sine of gamma over C. You can go through the same process of manipulation to get to solve for C. You would have to move C to the top tier first, right? And then move A, right? Well, you could, if you treat this as a fraction, you could kind of do it in one shot. You could say, all right, well, if I multiply times the reciprocal of this, right? I can do two steps at once. It would be um, alpha over sine of alpha. This would cancel this, and this would cancel this, and then you would put it over here in that arrangement. A over the sine of alpha. That means that C is equal to A up in front, just because it's a coefficient. Sine of gamma was there. And sine of alpha would end up on the bottom no matter what. And then again, you plug in the, the values that you have. So A is for sure 10. That wasn't measured by me. Sine of gamma is uh, 30 degrees. And we calculated, let's see. Well, alpha is 50, so that is known as well. So we get C is uh, 10 times the sine of 30 divided by the sine of 50. And you end up with this. If you round it to the tenths place, so it's say about 6.5. 6.5. Okay. 
you can see it's pretty handy, right? Again, the basic gist of it is that if you have three out of four parts in a ratio set equal to the second ratio, a proportion equation, then you could just arrange it to give you what you're looking for. Let me get a sip of water. triangle. It's not a right triangle. So I really should exaggerate that just for the sake of clarity. There you go. Something like that. And the labeling is alpha, gamma here for whatever reason, and beta this way. And you have dimensions of 12, 9, and this one is not known. So if you're gonna solve, that means you're looking for the three side dimensions and the three angle dimensions. Side oftentimes, especially if they just give you a vague description and no picture, uh, what is related to what. Right? Again, across from angle A, um, angle alpha would be A. Right? So that is the one thing that is not known. Right? Across from angle B, um, angle beta, pardon me, gamma in this case, would be C. So that is 12. And across from angle B is 9. Now some additional information I should include as well. Let's say in this case I only gave you one angle. So um, 85 in here. That means that you know just this. 85 degrees. Don't know that, don't know that. Two sides, one angle. Let us decide, um, is it more appropriate to use laws of sines or laws of cosines in this case? Um, let's see. If we have a side length and another side length here, I'm just highlighting basically, and an angle over here, what we have is a side, a side, and an angle. That is the politely written third one. It looks like this. A side, a side, and an angle. Right. So it's in a different uh, read, read backwards in this case. Okay. This is read a little bit, perhaps more intuitively. So this is gonna be another law of sign problem, all right, to get these other things. We can't use, unfortunately, um, the triangle angle sum theorem just yet. What we could do is instead um, use just laws of signs first. So uh, let's see, we're gonna have to go with the gamma one. So if you have sine of gamma and C, and then we'll do either A or B, it really doesn't matter. So I'm gonna just start with alpha over A. Right. 
Uh, you know what? I'm going to have to go with beta in this case. Sorry. B over B. Because that's the other thing that I know. This is a B value. This has to be B. Okay. So, mm, let's see. Fill in the information you have. Gamma is 85 degrees. C is apparently 12. Beta is unknown, so we'll find that angle. Um, and then we know that the length is 9. Okay. Um, let me rearrange this to get, isolate the trig function for beta. So I'm going to move 9 from where it is over to here. Which means that if I read this sine of beta is equal to 9 times the sine of 85 degrees over 12, I can use an inverse trig function to calculate for beta. So beta would be equal to the inverse sine of 9 over 12, which you could reduce to 3 fourths if you like, sine of 85. The inverse sine of 9 divided by 12 times the sine of 85. And it should get this, 48.3. I would go to as far as the tenths place just because um, you're going to have to find another angle. All right? So round it uh, just past the, one, the, uh, whole person, the whole degree. Um, okay, so beta therefore here is about 48.3. If you want, at this point, in theory, you could use the triangle angle sum theorem to calculate this other angle. In fact, that probably would be the best thing to do. Right. Um, alpha would be equal to 180 minus the sum of 48.3 plus 85. Add these two, then subtract from 180. All right. And what you should get is alpha is approximately 46.7 degrees, degrees. Okay. Now, knowing that, we can figure out what the actual side dimension of A is. So, let me just make some space here. If the sign of, I would go with the original one just to be a little bit more precise. It's not wrong to use 48.3, but because it's rounded, it might, you know, fudge it a little bit. So, uh, sine of gamma over C is equal to the sine of alpha over A. All right, and we're looking for A specifically, so we're going to rearrange this. A moved, and then the reciprocal of this would be that on the opposite side. So A is equal to C on top, and then the sine of alpha, and then the sine of gamma on the bottom. This basically flipped upside down over there. Right, on the opposite side of A. So if you input alpha is 46.7, I guess we have no choice but to use one of the rounded ones, it looks like 85 here, and the dimension that is known is 12. Twelve times the sine of forty-six point seven 
divided by the sine of 85. And you get something like that. 8.76 it looks like. So approximately 8.8. .8. And we have all the more six parts. Right? This is therefore solved. Right? Okay. Let's do another. And we'll do some areas. triangle like this and their label is alpha beta and gamma and this is 30 in here 30 degrees 10 and 12 again in theory we're looking for a, B, and C, and alpha, beta, and gamma. And we have to decide what is given. Right. Across from beta would be a B here. That is apparently not known. Right. Across from alpha would be A here, and that is known. So we know that A is 10 units, whatever it may be. Across from gamma here is 12, so we know that that we're going to call C. And the only angle known is 30. So what do we have here? We have um, a side, an angle, and a side. Which means, if we were going to choose formulas, the thing that this most closely resembles are these two categories would be this one. Side, angle, side. That is an angle between two sides. So therefore we will borrow a formula from here. Right? We just have to be careful about what we choose. We want one of the formulas that has the, um, the appropriate pieces. Right? The angle that is given to us, in this case is beta. So what we should probably do is go with um, this law of cosine. The one that solves for b. b squared is equal to c squared, uh, well it's actually a squared, a squared plus c squared minus 2ac I believe it is, or is it a, yes, ac. Cosine of beta. That version of it would be best. How come? Because A and C are the sides that are in between the angle. Right? Chosen because side angle side. Right? These are the two sides that are between that angle. That is the angle, these are the two sides. Okay, so mm, let's see. Um, A is 10, and C is 12, and they would be here again as well. And the angle is 30. Okay, you could crunch number, you could enter this straight into your calculator and just take a square root. Um, but a lot of it you can do uh, without a calculator, actually. So, think about it this way. 
Um, first of all, what's 100 squared? Pardon me, what's 10 squared? 100, right? What's 12 squared? 144. And then there's a third term, which means you could, in theory, combine these. It's kind of cheating, I know. It's like following the order of operations rigidly, but it would be legal. All right. Um, so this would be 244. B squared is equal to 244 plus, minus rather, 2 times 10 times 12. Now, before you jump the gun, and I know that I did this myself, let me just write that out. Cosine of 30 is what trig ratio if you had a triangle that was 30 degrees this way? So 30, 60, 90 type. Cosine is adjacent to 30, so that would be square root of 3 over a hypotenuse of 2, famously, right? If you don't multiply this, if you strategically try to figure out what the trig ratio is independent, independently of the calculator, then you could just do this, cross out the 2s, you know. Right? And then you have 10 times 12, which is 120. So you have 120 square root of 3. Um, this is as compacted down as I would get it before entering into my calculator. There is one other thing you have to do is take a square root here and take a square root of this entire other side. This is what you enter. The square root of 244 minus 120 times the square root of 3. Be careful because of the syntaxes. All right, yeah, you need to appropriately include parentheses. All right, so you should have something like that. The square root of 244 minus 120 times the square root of 3. And you would see that that is about 6. Being that it is 6.01, I would round it to a whole number, right. which means that the B value is about 6. All right. Now we need to find angles. You could, if you want to, um, probably use continue to use laws of cosines, but it may not be necessary. In fact, you may just have to use it once, if at all. And I would actually go for a uh, law of sine because it's less complex and it will accomplish the same thing. So, <clears throat> namely, free up some space here. Uh, what is next is let's try to figure out what. Um, Alpha is potentially. Um, you could use the law of cosine or the law of sine. All right. Let's just say, for argument's sake, that you went with law of cosine. All right. You would end up using the inverse cosine of b squared plus c squared minus a squared over 2bc. Right. And again, this is just one of the laws of cosines rearranged to solve for A. The only added step is that I wrote the inverse where it's supposed to be. Right. It's this version of it, right. which means that it came from the top one again. You could use these if you want. It would work. All right. this is, as long as you have one angle and you have two sides, it's fine. Um, but just to show you this. All right. So in place of B squared... You have 6 in theory, in place of C you have 12, and in place of A you have 10. And down here for B and C you have 6 and 12 again. So uh, 36 plus 144 and then minus 100. 36 and 144 is 180, and 180 minus 100 is um, 80. Um, 6 times tw uh, 2 is 12, and 12 times 12 is 144. So you can enter this into your calculator with a cosine of a, the ratio of 80 over 144.
And you would see you get something like that. 56.2, it looks like, or 0.3 if you round it. So 56.3 approximately. And now you could do the same thing um, for uh, gamma, but in that case, you might as well just use the, you know, the triangle angle sum theorem, right? So if you have uh, 180 minus the sum of 56.3 plus 30, that's really 180 minus uh, 86.3. And you get something like 90 something, let's see. Just cheap, okay. 180 minus 86.3. Uh, you get approximately 93.7. Okay. Have all six parts, you've solved it. And there's lots of different choices. Okay. Okay, now what I'll do last is uh, I'll do two area problems and then I'll stop. Okay. Now just to show you what you would use. Um, the area formulas that you will use are, in lieu of the traditional area of a triangle formula, which is base times height divided by two, right? which you could expand to one half times the base times the height. Um, if you're given, a side angle side, you could use any incarnation of these three right, to calculate the area. Where does it come from? Um, taking advantage of, again, trig ratios. If this is H in here for the height, right, then the height would be derived from um, the hypotenuse here and the angle that is here. It's basically sine is opposite of a hypotenuse, just rearranged for the y value, which we're calling h, right? And then the base would be perpendicular to that, right? Do remember the height and the base dimensions are always perpendicular, right? Which is why, if you've ever seen different incarnations of a triangle, right, it's famously a right triangle, right? And here's, um, an obtuse triangle. That even though the dimension from this corner to this point here is referred to as the base, the slant is certainly not the height of it. What they often do in the diagrams is they will draw out a right triangle here and then we'll read that as the height. Even though it is outside the actual shape, right, that height has to be perpendicular to this base. In the case of a right triangle, they usually call that the base and this the height. Okay, um, so let's just say hypothetically you were asked to um, find area given just three dimensions. That you're told that A is 90, that B is equal to 52, and that gamma is equal to 102 degrees. And we're just looking for the area. Right. I would draw a picture, all right, just to summarize this information, but you might be able to get away with not doing that. Um, so, Let's say that you have an oblique triangle like so, and this is normally, um, A is normally here, and 
let's see. B we'll pull here, which means that this is alpha, and this is beta in that case, and that this would be gamma, and this would be C here. All right. We know the, the gamma angle is 102. We don't know these two um, angles, but we do know that B is 52 and that A is 90. That means that we are given a side, an angle, and a side. That is to say, an angle that exists between two side dimensions. Therefore, this is basically um, the area formula that looks like this. One half um, the base dimension, um, in this case, we'll call A, it doesn't have to be, but we will, um, A, and the height dimension will be this trig ratio, B sine of gamma. This is the base, this is the height. Ultimately, when you're trying to decide which incarnation of this that you choose uh, from those that exist, is to just choose the dimensions that would be in between the angle, right? So A and B was in relation to gamma here, okay? So um, you would put 90 in here and 52 in here, and the alpha is, uh, pardon me, the gamma is 120. And it's kind of cheesy because you really don't have to do anything else except choose the correct formula. All right, plug that into your calculator correctly. All right, you could use 0.5, you could use the half, whichever you prefer. 0 0.5 times 90 times 52 sine of 102. You get this, 2288.86 it looks like. So maybe, since it wasn't specified, maybe we round it to a whole number. So 2,289 units squared. Whatever the units are squared. So you're given a drawing that looks like this, and you're just given three dimensions, um, A, B, and C, right? Uh, none of the usual angles, I don't know why this book switches from one thing to another. Right? Um, this being 10, and this being, seven, and this being 15. Right. I always use the highlighter when I'm drawing these myself. All right. Look at what you're given. You have an ang uh, pardon me, a side length A, and a side length B, and a side length C. So no angles. All, right. All you have is three sides, which means S, S, S. Right. In theory, um, this would imply that you're going to use law of co cosines. But if you're just looking for the area, right, to find area, we use a Heron, oh, pardon me, Heron's formula. There's an added step, though, in the case of Heron's formula. Heron is a person, a famous mathematician, and they refer to him as a geometer. Um, 
Why? Because that was the popular map at the time, right? Geometry. Uh, he was um, either Egyptian or Greek or perhaps uh, both. Uh, but he lived in the first century AD or CE, if you prefer. All right. Um, and part of the Roman Empire at the time. So he was, uh, there's a technical phrase for this, uh, Hellenized Egyptian at any rate. He lived in Alexandria where the famous library was. He was a math teacher of some sort. Anyhow, brilliant person. Not only came up with this formula, but invented a very early uh, steam turbine, right? You know, you know, the steam engine was famously invented by James Watt in 1801. So this is like 2,000 years before that almost, you know, or at least 1,900 years, 1,800. Um, there are two formulas that you really need to use. The, 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 Heron's uh, formula, and I'm struggling with his name because they sometimes refer to him as Hero, all right? Heron is a, an Egyptian sort of sounding version of his name, and Hero would be sort of a Greek sounding version of his name. So again, he probably was, it was a dude that lived in Alexandria, Egypt, so he was Egyptian. All right, I would go with Heron. Heron. The area of formula is the square root of a value known as S multiplied by differences from S lowercase letters, A, B, and C, right? This is derived not from calculus, right? Um, it is the geometry, right? Um, but you need to calculate what is referred to as the semi-perimeter first. And that is just literally a half of a perimeter. Right. That's what the S is, though. So, uh, if a perimeter is the sum of the sides, it would be what A plus B plus C is. Right. If you know A is 10, and B is 7, and C is 15, what's half of that sum? That is your S value. So, to do it rather quickly, 10, and 7 is 17, and 17 plus 15 is 32, Half of 32 would mean that the semi-perimeter would be 16 units, whatever it may be. Um, therefore, you would fit a 16 in here, and in here, and in here, and in here. And then incorporate 10, 7, and 15 as well. Right. I would do the little bit of arithmetic that you can, uh, just to crunch it down as best you can before you take a, a radical here. Uh, so this is really 16 times uh, minus uh, 6, and then that's minus 7 would be 9, and that would be 1. Um, 6 and 9 I recognize as 54, so just personal preference. Perhaps one might say um, 16 times 54, and then type that. We well, might have a better derivative. So. The square root of 16 times 54 is approximately 29. And since it's an area, 29.4 if you round it to the tenth, tenth place, the area would be about 29.4 units squared, because it's an area. Okay? Um, that is it for the semester in terms of the material. I'm going to look at the uh, my open math assignments and edit it if necessary. I don't think it includes anything else other than what I've just discussed, but I always like to make sure. Um, anyhow, uh, I sent a message as to what the schedule is for this week, but uh, today is Tuesday. All right, um, for homework, all right, uh, please do the last two sections, uh, 10.1 and 10.2 practice in my open math. Right. I can't give you the week, unfortunately, because I have to submit the grades before then. Um, so that's kind of why I moved the schedule, as I mentioned, this being Tuesday, all right, rather than doing this on Thursday. 
Um, this will be due by Friday evening. Right, this week. All right. uh, what I'm going to do on Thursday all right, is I'm going to shoot a video discussing uh, solutions for the final. All right. I want to give you the final just to have basically because it summarizes all of the material that we would have you would need to know in theory going into whatever the subsequent classes for you I would assume calculus anyhow I'll give you that as a freebie okay if you do the extra credit all right that is also due by Friday night Right, this week right, and that's basically it right just please for the sake of experience which is the most important thing do those this week right and that's it you'll have covered everything all right which is cool good all right it's getting cold be careful out there